Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Grand Rounds this morning. Um, it is my pleasure and delight to introduce Dr. Anissa Abidargam, today's Grand Rounds speaker. She will talk to us today about insights into the pathophysiology of schizophrenia from her multimodal brain imaging studies. Dr. Abi Dargam is the Lori Endowed Chair in Psychiatry and Professor of Psychiatry and Radiology at Stony Brook University Renaissance School of Medicine in New York. I could take a whole hour, the whole hour we have telling you about Anissa's brilliant career, but instead I'll give you a few highly curated bullet points that highlight her career. She was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2016 the same year she was president of ACNP, the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology. She has received a long list of awards from organizations that are near and dear to my heart. One, the National Alliance for Research in Schizophrenia and Depression, or NARSAD, and now known as the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, has recognized her excellence in schizophrenia research with five separate awards. Two of these were Young Investigator Awards. One was the Independent Investigator Award and another the Distinguished Investigator Award. These were capped off by the highest honor NARSAD confers for schizophrenia research, the coveted Lieber Prize. NAMI or the National Alliance on Mental Illness also honored her with a Lieber Prize for her work on schizophrenia. In addition, she is the recipient of a long list of NIH grants to study schizophrenia and psychosis more generally. I think you will agree that there is no one better qualified to tell us about insights into schizophrenia than Dr. Abi Dargam. Today, she will be telling us about her research using positron emission tomography or PET, a method that she pioneered to study dopamine and schizophrenia. As most of you know, and to paraphrase the title of one of her papers, Dopamine is the wind of the psychotic fire. Today, she will highlight the impact of dopaminergic abnormalities on brain development, circuitry, and function. On a personal note, Anissa told me that when she was growing up in Lebanon, she wanted to be a painter, but there was no school for painting where she lived. So she punted to her second choice, psychiatry. <laughs> Perhaps inspired by her love of artistically rendered images, or perhaps inspired by the need to understand brain function in people's schizophrenia, she has made a brilliant career of imaging the brain of people with schizophrenia. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Anissa Abidargam. Thank you, Judy. Um, this is, is making me blush. You can see it, but this is such a nice <laughs> introduction. Um, very moving and, um, uh, you know, confirming how close I feel to you and uh, how I, how much I respect you in, uh, and also in all your accomplishments for schizophrenia research, just kind of makes us uh, soulmates in a way. <laughs> so uh, I would have loved to be in person visiting you and spending some time with you and visiting UCSF and, uh, uh, you know, also meeting with Matt whom we've spent many hours uh, sitting in, in meetings, reviewing the intramural program. So um, hopefully someday I'll have this opportunity. So thank you for this invitation. And um, so what I decided to do is I kind of have to start by telling you a little bit the beginning of the story. So some of the data is data that is published, but since this is a Grand Rounds audience, I felt like I needed to go over uh, some of those kind of um, basic um, uh, facts, uh, information, published data, and then bring you to what we're doing more recently. And that is kind of um, um, linking some of the PET uh, classical imaging with more multimodal type of imaging. So, um, okay skipped my disclosures. Um, I'm um, associate editor for two journals. I'm an NPAS study section, and I consult for some companies. So this is the outline of my talk. Um, I'm going to give you first some background on schizophrenia, dopamine, and PET imaging of dopamine, and then take you through what we 
have found in the results in Australiatum and how we use multimodal imaging to understand the functional impact of these findings and then move on to the cortex and extra striatal regions, including the midbrain. And then some of our new directions was cholinergic system imaging with PET and neuromelanin MR imaging of dopamine and then synthesis. Okay, so starting with the, the first part, um, what is striking about schizophrenia is that there are so many different type of symptoms that uh, that kind of involve different systems in the brain. You have psychosis, reward deficits, mood disturbances, cognitive deficits, even mo movement abnormalities before somebody is exposed to any antipsychotics, which kind of tells you that so many systems involved in emotional processing, cognitive processing, um, mood, movement, psychomotor function are all uh, altered or affected by the disease, which kind of tells me that it's a global brain disease. And one important fact about this, um, this globality is to think about the role of dopamine within the systems that could be involved in all these dysfunctions. This is kind of a cartoonish representation of the cortico striato palidotalamocortical loops, and it's color-coded, inspired by some of the work uh, of Suzanne Haber, for a limbic, a cognitive, and sensory motor uh, functioning. And you see that every area within these important loops that are essential for organizing our behavior is modulated by dopamine. And what is dopamine doing in these regions and, and subserving these circuits? There are three important functions that I want to highlight. Um, this is just to, because I refer back to this. So this is the mesocortical projection, mesolimbic to the ventral striatum, and then nigrostriatal to the midsection of the striatum, calling this the associative striatum, and then the sensory motor um, striatum. So that's the nigrostriatal sensory motor projection. So what are some of the important functions of dopamine that I want to highlight here? First, in the midbrain, uh, in the VTA, dopamine cell firing predicts or, or uh, tracks the mismatch between expectations and experience. This is the important work of, of Wolfram Schulz showing that dopamine cells fire to unexpected reward. Uh, dopamine cells can fire to the prediction of the reward with a cue. This is when you present a rat with a sugar pellet uh, or indicates that the rat is gonna receive a sugar pellet. And if this indication is not followed by the actual experience of the reward, the sugar pellet, dopamine cells silence. So they're really kind of firing to the prediction of the reward or to the incidence of a reward that's unpredicted and silence when the reward that is predicted doesn't happen. This is an important teaching signal as telling the rats something is good, you may go ahead, something is bad, you should, you should stop. Another important function of, do of dopamine is in the prefrontal cortex. And this is an illustration from the work of Patricia O'Donnell showing that dopamine via its actions on D1 and D2 receptors modulating the main circuitry within the prefrontal cortex, which is the pyramidal glutamatergic cell and the GABAergic interneuron, can modulate the neural activity within the prefrontal cortex basically sharpening the signal. The transition from a juvenile cortex to an adult cortex translates into this kind of increase in signal to noise. And that is because D1 effect on the glutamatergic pyramidal cell is enhanced. And the D2 effect on the GABAergic cell flips around to become excitatory which means you're increasing inhibition and you're boosting excitation, which results in this kind of modulation of a better, sharper signal. And this transition does not occur in some of the animal models of the disease. So again, very important function in the prefrontal cortex for cognition. A third function that I think is also critical is the modulation of the 
output from the basal ganglia back onto the thalamus, which communicates back to the cortex. So the projections from the striatum are GABAergic, they're called medium spiny neurons, and they can either bear the D1 receptor or the D2 receptor. So you have D1 pathway, we call that also the GO pathway or the direct pathway, and a D2 pathway, which is the no-go, the indirect pathway. And because of the way the circuitry works, the D1 pathway releases the, the thalamus to speak back to the cortex, basically um, allows the, the thalamocortical uh, information processing to proceed. So it's facilitatory onto the thalamic projection. While the D2 pathway is inhibitory, so basically the balance between D1 and D2 determines the output from the basal ganglia onto the cortex. And D1 is a go pathway, facilitates action. D2 is a no-go pathway. And this basically is under, um, underlying all our behavior across all functional domains uh, in terms of approach or avoidance. So just to give you a little bit more of a detail of the circuitry and how it works, you see how the D1, you have an inhibition onto the inhibition, which facilitate the thalamus speaking back to the cortex, while the D2 has this extra loop. And you see how dopamine is modulating all these structures that are essential for our functioning. Now, the reason I really got interested and dopamine is when I started my career, there was, you know, the knowledge that D2 drugs are antipsychotics and pretty much all antipsychotics are D2 drugs, still true to this uh, day, unfortunately. And dopamine agonists increase psychosis. So fortunately at that time, you know, there was the beginning of the uh, PET uh, imaging uh, methodology development. So we were part of this kind of a new tool development and the dopamine system was, in a way, it's a lucky system because there were a lot of uh, tools to image the dopaminergic machinery. I'm representing here to you the synaptic machinery of dopamine. This is a dopaminergic projection. Uh, you have tyrosine that becomes dopamine stored in vesicles and then release in synapse. You have the postsynaptic uh, medium spiny neuron. This is a representation of the striatum. So to image the D2 receptor, we have uh, many uh, radio tracers for that. I'll speak to you about them later. We also have ways of imaging dopamine synthesis, the activity of aromatic amino acid decarboxylase. So if we inject F18 labeled DOPA, it goes into this kind of uh, route and it becomes F18 dopamine and it's stored here. So you have accumulation of a radioactive signal that you can detect with a positron emission tomography scanner. Uh, so it's kind of an index of dopamine synthesis. We also have tools to image the vesicular monoamine transporter, which stores these dopamines inside vesicles to protect them from being destroyed by the monoamine oxidase enzyme or the catecholomethyl transferase enzyme. We also have tools to image the dopamine transporter, which is, you know, the hoover of the system. It cleans up dopamine from the synapse and takes it back inside the presynaptic cell. And then we can image dopamine levels themselves, which is really what I've spent most time doing. And how do we do that? We were interested in dopamine. So the way to do that is that we have to combine multiple D2 scans under multiple conditions. So the first condition is the baseline. And you have here in purple, those dopaminergic D2 uh, receptors. In blue is the D2 radio tracer, and in red is dopamine. When we inject a D2 radio tracer, it's gonna flow and then go to the brain sites where D2 receptors are, and it's gonna bind to those. And because it's radioactive, will emit a signal, the, the scanner will detect the signal, we quantify it, and we calculate a binding potential, which is basically ego, equal to how many D2 receptors are there. Now, the issue is that some D2 receptors are occupied by dopamine, so the radio tracer cannot bind to those. And because of that, this measure that we have has already this kind of built-in little 
artifact, which is some are not visible. But then we take advantage of this with the following uh, paradigms. If you inject a stimulant and you, you just kind of provoke a massive release of dopamine and you do a second scan, now those D2 receptors are gonna be occupied by dopamine more so than before. And so your radio tracer will have less, fewer D2 to occupy. So this image will be less radioactive and the binding potential, the measure will be lower. And the difference between this binding potential and the previous one tells you how much dopamine was stored in those presynaptic nerve terminals and was released. So it's a dopamine storage and release measure. This, the difference between the two. We also could do the following, we can deplete dopamine. Depleting it is blocking the synthesis and, and doing this for long enough so that there's basically no dopamine in the synapse. Now all the D2 receptors are available to bind to the radio tracer. And if you compare this one, this binding potential, which is much higher to this initial one, the difference is basically all the D2 receptors that were occupied by dopamine and they got unmasked and now are available to the radio tracer. So it's a measure of D2 occupancy by dopamine at baseline. So combining all these methodologies, what did we uh, find? And also combining it with the fact that we, we needed to look at different places in the brain using a uh, carbon 11 raclopride, which is a D2 radio tracer that has an affinity of about one nanomolar. You can just image D2 in the striatum. Phalipride um, can allow you to measure D2 outside of the striatum, but not the cortex. FLB457 can be used to image the cortex, gives you enough of a signal there. The signal in the striatum was FLB, although it's very high, is not usable because you cannot quantify it because you do not reach equilibrium of binding within the time frame of the experiment. You know, as we can talk about this later, not important here, but what's important is that basically it's a cortical ligand. So we also worked with Suzanne Haber because we wanted to know where in the striatum are the abnormalities. So we developed methods to draw regions around specific substructures of the striatum that have specific functional uh, spe specialties. So the ventral striatum is this limbic striatum. The associative striatum has three, precommissural caudate, precommissural putamen, and postcommissural caudate. And the sensory motor striatum is basically the posterior putamen. So combining all these methodologies, we could examine where is dopamine abnormal within the striatum and in which direction. And these are the results. People who have used uh, F-DOPA imaging and many of those labs around the world have found the same. F-DOPA synthesis is increased in psychosis and schizophrenia and also in the prodrome. So in people who are at risk and it predicts who's gonna become psychotic. Dopamine release and intrasynaptic baseline levels are also increased. D2 receptors are increased only in patients who've received antipsychotic medications and are now drug-free. So in the drug-naive state, there is no increase in D2 receptors. D1 receptors, dopamine transporter, VMAT2, and the striatum are all normal. Now, where was in the striatum is the biggest increase? We found that actually the unmasking of D2 receptor was the AMPT paradigm, so revealing the biggest amount of D2 occupancy by dopamine in patients with schizophrenia represented here in blue versus controls represented in white was the highest in the precommissural caudate, the rostral caudate, part of the associative striatum. And that was a surprise. We all expected it to be in the ventral striatum uh, because of the mesolimbic hypothesis of schizophrenia. This finding was replicated with the F-DOPA study, so it's a, a solid piece of information now that actually the associative striatum is really where most of the abnormality is, and in particular the precommissural caudate, which is interesting because this is the area of projection of the DLPFC and, and other 
uh, associative cortical regions. We also found that the highest the amount of dopamine and the synapse that we measured with imaging predicted the best response to antipsychotics in these patients. Their psychosis did very well if they have high dopamine and you give them D2 drugs. However, if their dopamine is somewhat normal, this is the range of controls, they didn't have such a drastic response in their psychosis to treatment. And this was replicated 10 years later by Oliver House looking at F-DOPA in patients with schizophrenia and showing that responders are the ones that have high F-DOPA, high dopamine synthesis, while treatment-resistant patients had pretty much normal levels similar to controls. So if people are dopaminergic, their psychosis will do well to our medications, which are basically all D2 blockers or, or D2 functional blockers. We also saw that after amphetamine, which induces a transient increase in psychosis, the more dopamine release, the more psychotic patients became. And you know, this is not surprising, but what's interesting and why I'm showing you this is the following. Then we studied a small cohort of patients who, in addition to schizophrenia, have addiction, comorbid addiction. So we call them dual diagnosis. And because of the addiction, their dopamine release is low, it's blunted, just like what you see in alcoholics, cocaine um, uh, abusers, heroin abusers. I mean, this is across the board. All addictions create this kind of depletion of dopamine. But these patients who have schizophrenia in addition to their addiction had this interesting uh, result where even within these low levels of dopamine release, they had an acute relationship, a significant relationship between the small amount of dopamine change and small amount of D2 stimulation by dopamine and an increase in psychosis that was similar to what we saw in the patient that had a much broader range of dopamine. So what does that mean? Basically means that even when dopamine is low, there is something in the system and the dopaminergic system possibly related to D2 function that makes make patients with schizophrenia super sensitive to any stimulation. And you know, we don't understand what is the super sensitivity of D2 receptor exactly is at this point. Uh, there are studies undergoing to understand it better. But there's a, so the, the, base, the basic conclusion is that there is excess in presynaptic dopamine release, but we also need to keep in mind that there may be a dysfunction of the D2 receptor itself that is beyond numbers. It's more about the functionality of it and sensitivity to dopamine stimulation. Okay, so now how do we understand the functional impact of this excess dopamine and the striatum? So we did, uh, in collaboration with people in my groups who were more of uh, MR type of uh, methodologists, we examined the, the two, two, two areas of, of interest. First, we wanted to understand whether the connectivity of the striatal substructures to the rest of the brain was different in patients versus control and controls. And this is what we found. In controls, the pattern of connectivity is that you have this kind of supremacy of the rostral caudate, where it is the region within the subregion within the striatum that is most highly connected to cortical regions. This supremacy of the rostral caudate is lost in patients with schizophrenia. And this, the, the more abnormal the connectivity pattern was, the more psychotic patients were. So what we can conclude is that this excess dopamine and the rostral caudate is affecting the connectivity of the rostral caudate and somehow contributing to psychosis. Another functional aspect that we were interested in is the following. So how do you go from just excess dopamine and the rostral caudate to somebody hearing a voice. I mean, we're, we have shown you the relationship to psychosis and essentially uh, auditory hallucinations are one of the main, main psychotic symptoms in schizophrenia. So we wanted to understand how does dopamine set somebody up 
to have to to have the ability to hear a voice. And again, here we use multimodal imaging. So the patients who are getting uh, PET imaging also receive this other type of fMRI imaging during auditory task to examine the basic cognitive mechanism that could bias people to have um, auditory hallucinations and the contribution of dopamine to that. So let me take you through this uh, a little bit and bear with me. So we sometimes think that if we're hearing something, we're just recording a signal. And the reality is more complicated than that. So we, it, it's an integration between what we're exposed to, the context, our prior experience, what the sensory stimulus strength is that will lead to an actual uh, real percept. So here in red, you're seeing the effect of context or prior. In blue is the sensory signal, and this is the result. So if the prior is weak, then the sensory input is recorded more accurately. If the prior is strong, the sensory input is gonna be biased by this prior and is gonna be recorded closer to the prior than to its actual um, itself intensity or its experience. And so this, this bias perception is kind of, or the effect of prior, we call that kind of a top-down effects and the sensory input is more like the bottom uh, up effect. This kind of bias perception we're able to examine in, in patients versus controls. So to kind of translate this to you a little bit more and to just kind of show you what we found, imagine you're hearing a very short auditory signal. Then you hear a longer signal and you're asked to record how long is it. You will, be, you will tend to record it as shorter than it actually is just because of the influence of this very predictable um, kind of certain context. If the context or the priors are sometimes long, sometimes short, sometimes in between, then when you're presented with the signal, you will record it more accurately as it is, as long as it is. So here, because the priors are uncertain, they lose their influence. We call this the uncertainty effect. And this is basically what we measured and what we kind of uh, analyzed. And what we found is that patients with schizophrenia lose this uncertainty effect. So they lose the accuracy of an uncertain prior. They're basically overly influenced by the prior. And what we found is that this weakening of the prior is related to more hallucinations and more dopamine release, both in the associative striatum and in the striatum as a whole. To summarize this complicated story, excess dopamine in the striatum makes you overconfident in your expectations and will bias perception, which could lead to hallucinations. At least we gave proof of concept for this. Obviously more work needs to happen, but this is one direction with which um, we benefited from combining all these imaging modalities. So to summarize the part I've told you about the striatum, we measured increased dopamine release and the associative striatum. Um, this was related to more psychosis, better treatment response to antipsychotics, weaker connectivity to the cortex of this particular uh, substriatal uh, structure, substructure of the striatum, and more perceptual bias leading to more hallucinations. So big impact. Now, let me take you into the cortex and extracerebral regions. So for, uh, to, to look at, the, to, of, at dopamine release in the cortex, we, this actually took us many years. You know, it wasn't an easy measure to do because uh, there's much less dopamine in the cortex than there is in the striatum. And the way to study it is more complicated. But basically we ended up using FLB457, which allows us to image D2 receptors before and after amphetamine so we could examine cortical dopamine release. And what we found is the following. In patients with schizophrenia, 
uh, dopamine, the change between the two scans was zero on average, while in controls it was 10%, which is what we predict. So patients with schizophrenia on average did not show any dopamine release in the cortex. And this capacity to release dopamine in both groups was related to the ability of these subjects to activate during a working memory task. This is the bold signal during the task, working memory task minus the control task. And so in both groups, the more dopamine release uh, capability, the better they were able to activate their prefrontal cortex. Uh, in addition, we found using, so, so this was done with the self-ordered um, working memory task, a special working memory task was like eight steps. But using the end back, we also found that dopamine release, uh, more dopamine release related to better performance on working memory task. Uh, this is something I was looking for, but we did not find this was every working memory task. We just found it was the end back. And I don't know if this really is, um, you know, just a lucky finding or, um, it needs to be replicated because it's a small sample, but it's kind of a result that's exciting to me. Uh, what it really shows in a way that the fact that we can detect it with any working memory task is that maybe there are differences between these tasks, but also that the relationship between dopamine and working memory is kind of a complex one and there are many variables to take into account. What was exciting also about this FLB study is the following. In addition to the DLPFC, which was what we were interested in because of the story of mesocortical dopamine being deficient in schizophrenia, is that we could obtain measures in every brain region outside of the cortex. All other cortical regions, insula, amygdala, hippocampus, thalamus, and the midbrain, substantia nigra and VTA. And again, the same picture in black are controls and in red are patients. And what you see controls release a little bit of dopamine. So you see a kind of a displacement of the radio tracer, but not in patients. And what was mostly surprising to us is the fact that in the midbrain also, there was little dopamine release in patients with schizophrenia. And that was puzzling because we imagined that the excess dopamine we had measured in the striatum would be originating from dopamine cells that are projecting to this region and that are overactive. So the fact that we measure a deficit of dopamine release in the midbrain tells us that this is an unlikely scenario that the dopamine release that is excessive in the striatum is not really originating from the midbrain pathway, but alternatively that it could be some local mechanism within the striatum here, the, the rustral caudate that is dysregulating dopamine release at the distal level. And so this is one direction we're going into that we uh, are interested in now is to understand could there be abnormalities in the striatum that are driving dopamine release? And when these abnormalities become apparent and dopamine goes overboard, that's, that's when you see the, the dopamine, uh, that's when you see the psychosis onset. One direction we took um, in order to examine that is to examine the cholinergic system. So within the striatum, you have inter, uh, uh, cholinergic interneurons. They're a very small percentage of striatal neurons, maybe like 4% or less, but they are very highly connected with all aspects of the striatal circuitry. And they regulate dopamine release in a very complex manner. I mean, dopamine and acetylcholine regulate each other in the striatum. Um, obviously, this, this, these cholinergic interneurons were kind of uh, a, an important target for us, but we also uh, should keep in mind that the acetylcholine system is, has, has as a you know, presence in the brain. There are these nuclei in the basal forebrain that projects throughout the cortex uh, and to the cerebellum, and also nuclei within the midbrain that project to um, other uh, areas. 
Oh, I'm sorry, I meant to the temporal cortex here. And the, the, the midbrain projects to the cerebellum. So we started to examine how could we interrogate the cholinergic system in particular because of our interest in the cholinergic interneuron and the striatum and its role in uh, regulating dopamine release. Uh, this, you know, the field has been interested in cholinergic developments for a long time. For example, nicotinic agonists have been tested. A muscarinic agonist are currently under testing. Xenomelin and 1M4 agonist showed positive results in schizophrenia and Alzheimer, but had peripheral side effects. But now Karuna Pharmaceutical is re-examining this by combining with, with xenomelin a peripheral muscarinic antagonist uh, to block these peripheral side effects. And they showed initial positive results at the midpoint analysis. So fingers crossed. Uh, Pfizer-Stigmine, which is a cholinesterase inhibitor, was shown many years ago to improve hallucinations. And scopolamine, was a, which is an M1 antagonist, could cause hallucinations. So a lot of interest you know, in the cholinergic system. But what did we do? So the cholinergic targets, you could go with receptors or non-receptors. For receptors, you have the nicotinic ones, uh, so channel receptors or uh, GPCR receptors, such as the muscarinic ones, M1, M2, M3, M4, M5. They have different locations in the brain, different functions. In terms of non-receptor targets, you could design a radio tracer for the acetylcholinesterase enzyme. Uh, to look how quickly acetylcholine is destroyed, uh, or the vesicular cholinergic transporter. So this is basically a, a measure of uh, dopamine uh, of acetylcholine storage capacity. There are some radio tracer for each one of the, these targets. We decided to go with this target, uh, an F18 VAT, to examine vesicular cholinergic transporters in the brain. And at this point, I have to apologize that our data is not as complete as we would like, and in part because of COVID. Um, this is what the images look like. And what we have, what I'm presenting here is 11 controls and 12 patients, so very preliminary. We have a few more, but basically the results have not changed. But there's something exciting that I wanted to show you, and then we'll, we'll you know, hopefully have a bigger cohort at some point when recruitment goes back to normal. So these are well matched on all kinds of uh, measures to make sure that the differences are related to the target we're looking at. Um, this is the volume of distribution. It's kind of equivalent to the binding potential I was mentioning to you earlier. In the ventral striatum and controls, uh, in the associative striatum and in the sensory motor striatum. So you see this kind of gradient from lower to higher as you go from ventral to dorsal. And then now I'm gonna superimpose on this the patients. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. And this is the extra striatal. So I mentioned to you the, the cholinergic projections to the rest of the brain. And you see here that it's much lower numbers. The, the scale here is 30 versus 80. So much more in the striatum, um, uh, you know, cholinergic innervation than outside of the striatum. Uh, so this is controls and the patients are in blue. So with this cohort at this point, there are no like striking differences. Initially, our initial first few, like seven patients showed some increase, but that increase kind of uh, tempered down and a slight decrease and outside the, the striatum. But again, that's just kind of becoming closer with time, with, with numbers. But what was, um, ah, oh, and we also have to examine the effects of medications because here in blue are the unmedicated patients and red are the medicated patients. So we're trying to, uh, populate this more with more uh, medicated patients to see if there's an upregulation due to antipsychotics, which would be an interesting, um, um, you know, piece of information to understand the effects of antipsychotics on the striatum. But what I wanted to show you is the following, which really is holding up with the bigger sample and is holding up in, in both groups, patients and control, and which is counterintuitive. 
what we are finding is that the higher the amount of cholinergic uh, innervation, the lower the function on multiple domain of cognitive functions, digit symbol, memory and executive, visual object recognition, matrix complex cognition, IQ, working memory. And, you know, I didn't make new slides with, the, with both groups and with the bigger sample, but it's all the same. Uh, and we're in the process of, uh, because we're using the pen CNB, CNB battery, we're in the process of uh, consulting with Ruben Gore about how to maybe like, you know, use uh, data reduction techniques and look at factors. But in our preliminary analysis of factors, again, these kind of load on factor one, and they show this kind of relationship where higher cholinergic indices are related to worse cognition in almost all brain regions. So we have to understand that. And I think that one critical important piece is to examine the postsynaptic site. Uh, so if you have more cholinergic vesicular transporters means more cholinergic innervation is the postsynaptic site, which would be the M1 receptor, the muscarinic M1 or other um, nicotinic receptors, but for the cortex was relevant as M1. Um, is that normal? Is that down-regulated, up-regulated? We'll have to, you know, we have to put both sides of the equation to be able to better understand this finding if it holds. Okay, um, so I may have um, maybe a few more minutes. How, how much more time I have, Judy? You're doing great, Anissa. Okay, so it's okay. okay. You should stop in eight minutes. In eight minutes? Okay, uh -huh. perfect. So then this is one of the last stories I wanted to tell you. So we've done all the striatal dopamine and, and many people have done uh, these kind of studies and we've shown that there's dopamine excess in the striatal. Again, using multimodal imaging uh, and in collaboration with Guillermo Herga, who was in my lab at um, Columbia, you know, one day we'll get together and say, hey, wouldn't it be nice to have an MR method to measure dopamine? And we start on this kind of journey that I'm really very happy about. And I've left uh, Columbia four years ago, but Guillermo is still actively working on this and we're still actively collaborating. These are some of the initial papers that have come out showing validation of this MR technique to measure a proxy for dopamine function in the brain. So basically when you have dopamine and the striatum is gonna be metabolized, the metabolites will uh, go back to the nigra, to the uh, cell body and will bind the uh, iron so they have, they can give a, an MR signal. And this neuromelanin is what became our target to measure. Uh, the way it's measured is that we get these slices through the midbrain. Uh, it's a specific MR sig uh, acquisition um, a 2D echo is magnetization transfer. Uh, you know, if you want to know the, the methodology, you re really have to look at these papers because I wouldn't be able to give you a whole lot of details about the methods for this MR acquisition. But uh, the bottom line is that we measure the intensity in the substantia nigra versus this reference region, which is the cruz cerebri, and we have a voxel-wise kind of ratio obtained. And um, um, Guillermo is again continuing to perfect the way to analyze this and make it automated. Um, this is another image of how the regions are drawn. Uh, but basically the validation is that we've done a series of, of studies. We've shown that this neuromelanin MRI captures the variability that you have uh, for neuromelanin that you measure in postmortem tissue. Uh, so took postmortem brain, put it in the MR, took it out and compared the MR measure to actual the HPLC measure in specific voxels. It also captures the variability for dopamine release in vivo. So the same healthy controls here uh, did the araclopride with amphetamine scan, measured the displacement, and did the enuromelanin and MR. And they also correlate quite well. Uh, in schizophrenia and in at risk group, neuromelanin correlates with the amount of psychosis. So again, it's measuring something that, that is functionally relevant. Um, 
So at this point, I propose that this is kind of a, an exciting potential biomarker because it's MR imaging. It could be used for multiple purposes. We could examine it in, uh, you know, in below 18 because you know PET cannot be used below age 18. So you could, ex you know, use it as early as whenever you can put a child in an MR scanner and look at it over time. Obviously, neuromelanin increases with time because the more dopamine is metabolized, the more this thing is going to accumulate in the nigra. We can look at trajectories over time and look at, for example, people who are at risk for psychosis, they have a different trajectory of dopamine uh, accumulation, maybe more. Uh, people who are at risk for substance abuse, do they have less? Um, what is the effect of antipsychotics? What is the effect of chronicity of the illness? Can you predict who will respond to antipsychotics? So this is a very easy to use biomarker that is giving us uh, functional information about the dopamine system. And we have lo lots of projects um, um, you know, going forward with that. Okay, so to do my uh, synthesis, I have to take you onto one small little detour, which is um, in order to interpret data in humans, sometimes you have to go to animals and because you could uh, look at causality in animals. And one thing we got interested in is the fact that this, this excess D2 stimulation and the striatum. Uh, and you know, is, is this something that is just a result of uh, faulty brain development, or is this something that is more fundamental to the development, to the aberrant development of the brain in schizophrenia? So we paired up with Eric Kendall and his lab, Christophe Kellendonk and Eleanor Simpson. And, and thank God Eric Kendall got interested in these uh, in our results because that, that is like uh, not an easy achievement to get Eric Kendall's attention. So he basically, they built a transgenic mouse that has during development for two weeks, an overexpression of D2 receptors and the dorsal striatum by 15% to mimic the results in, in patients. So this, then they looked at what happens to this mouse behaviorally, cognitively, circuitry wise, they did all kinds of analyses. And I'm just gonna give you the, the bottom line just to kind of take you onto my uh, conclusion. And so mouse had very interesting results because as it became um, adult, it had cognitive deficits that were not reversible and other kind of motivational deficits that were more reversible. But in addition, it had like a lot of uh, circuitry and molecular findings. So this is what I was talking to you about was the uh, go and um, no go pathway. Um, and what we found is that, I mean, what they find, found, I'm sorry, what they found, although they were part of a, of a county center that I had, but in this, in this mouse that had overexpression expression of the two receptor in this rate, they found decrease in dopamine metabolism or dopamine function in the cortex, decrease in GABA uh, function in the cortex, decrease NMDA expression on VTA dopamine cells, which related to lower function of these dopaminergic projections, uh, lower Q expressivity, and then a a, an increase in bridging collaterals between the no-go and the go pathway, basically shifting the balance of these two. So a lot of like off-site kind of alterations and the circuitry, the connectivity, the uh, you know reward function uh, kind of systems, and even anatomical sculpting within the basal ganglia, which can shift the basal ganglia output. So very uh, wide net off-site kind of um, um, repercussions from abnormal dopamine during development. Okay, so now I've told you all, all the pieces of the story and I'm just gonna tell you where we're at at this point. Uh, so I think that the way to think about what I've told you is that there could be um, influences during development in utero that may have to do possibly with genetic uh, 
um, vulnerability or even environmental vulnerability that may set the stage to have potentially increased dopamine during development. I mean, I don't have any evidence for that, but it could suggest that, you know, drugs, urbanicity, uh, inflammation could alter dopamine function during variable uh, times during development. This could lead, could have effect on the development of other molecules and cells, as I showed you with this D2 mouse, that will affect how the circuitry is built and, you know, um, how it functions. Uh, for example, there could be off-site alteration dopamine release in the cortex, pervalbumin, interneuron development, connectivity, synchrony, efficiency. All these that kind of set the stage for an abnormal development of the brain outside of the striatum and outside of um, just dopamine function. And at some point, there is kind of a, an additional... Uh, maybe a stressful event or um, kind of uh, an ultimate maturation of system that shows how deficient they are. We don't know why, but there is, could be an excess of presynaptic dopamine and the striatum that brings about the psychotic onset. And then after that was the story I've shown you about the dual diagnosis patients and how it is possible that there could be an abnormality in D2 function beyond presynaptic dopamine excess. It is possible that D2 blockers that we give our patients in addition to drugs that they take on their own could have kind of, you know, plasticity effect on the system that will manifest with lack of uh, responsivity, more resistance, um, lower dopamine, more abnormal D2 function what I would call a D2 sensitization, drug resistance, potentially leading to more psychosis, sort of dyskinesia, which is the ultimate kind of abnormal plasticity within these basal ganglia circuits. Okay, a lot of like, uh, you know, work to continue to be done. Uh, this is just kind of where we're at at this point. Uh, but hopefully, I uh, hope I've excited you and, and thinking about um, how we've used PET. I think PET is promising uh, for, for the type of research we do. Uh, unfortunately, I think PET has not gone as far as it should go, uh, but we can discuss that. But we have combined PET with um, cognitive and behavioral assessment with other MR imaging to be able to put the function with the molecular information. This can inform animal models that will feed back into our knowledge. And, and PET is also essential for identifying targets or biomarkers so that it can help therapeutic development. And with that, I wanna thank you for your attention and thank a very large group of people that I've had the honor of working with over the years. I've highlighted some of the work that I have talked about here. Uh, Guillermo and uh, Cliff Cassidy have done the neuromelanin work. Uh, Jared has done the working memory um, uh, functional activation work. I didn't talk about Judy's work here, but she's doing MRS um, uh, of the hippocampus in addition to neuromelanin. Um, obviously, Mark Slifstein up here has um, been a um, long-term collaborator with PET. And my preclinical collaborators, uh, Suzanne Haber from Rochester, and ad additionally, you know, we've often used the PET Center at Yale to do some of our work, and now collaborating with Ruben Gur for the cog cognitive testing with the cholinergic um, uh, imaging. And I also want to thank patients and families who volunteered and my funding agencies. Thank you, Judy. I hope I. <laughs> Thank you, Anissa. I don't know if you can hear the, the room full of applause. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, not. So just consider, <laughs> consider uh, everyone thanking you. Um, this was a wonderful tour de force of your brilliant career, and, and I thank you for that. Um, I'm especially excited that there is um, a way to do some of the sort of um, PET imaging using uh, neuromelanin that is uh, opens some doors, I think, to those 
those of us who don't have the ability to do pet imaging. There are a number of questions. Um, and I'm gonna just start from the top. Um, Atef Sheikh asks, what are your thoughts on the impact of nicotinic products like tobacco on psychosis? Um, so, I mean, nicotinic products mess with the cholinergic system in multiple ways. Um, first, nicotine will increase dopamine uh, release. And in addition, it stimulates nicotinic receptors. Um, you know, the acute effects are probably potentially pro-attentive, pro-cognitive. In terms of the effects on psychosis, it's hard to measure them if patients are already on D2 blockers. I mean, I would imagine that you could conceivably think that increasing dopamine and having a D2 receptor in the striatum that is un blocked could have some effect on D2 stimulation that would result in psychosis. Uh, but usually the amount of dopamine release is probably not that great with, with nicotine uh, effects so that we don't actually see a whole lot of effect on psychosis. Um, you know, long-term use of nicotine will have effects on dopamine release. It's been measured. Uh, people have looked at long-term smokers. The effects are not as disparaging or as profound as what you see with other drugs. Great. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but uh, it's, it's not a huge effect. That's very, very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Monica Sanchez uh, asks if you can offer any insights related to the schizophrenia spectrum illness as an important risk factor for COVID death. Maybe a little early, yeah, early in yeah, the pandemic yeah, no. to figure that out. But. I, I think this is very interesting. I actually thought about it and I wish somebody would, would do the study that I'm thinking about. But you know, one thing that is striking, um, actually my, my daughter uh, who's 22 got COVID. And you know, it was very mild, like two days, sore throat. But then for days and days, she kept saying she's tired. And I'm like, you know, how could you be so tired? And then it occurred to me, I mean, is it possible that COVID, I mean, okay, I'm very dopamine centric. So I thought, <laughs> is it possible that COVID is attacking dopamine cells in the midbrain, which would result in this kind of like anhedonia type of feeling that lingers on and on. And you, you hear described in, by many patients. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice to actually be able to measure something about patients who have protracted anhedonia after COVID and look at you know, effects on their dopamine in the brain in whichever way we could do it. Um, so in that sense, I've you know, linked the two but I don't know if that, if that is the angle that the question was focused on, but that's the, uh, the thing I would have liked to be able to do, or I would like to do, most like I want to do. Thank, thank you for that. I'm, I'm in the process of revising um, a grant proposal to study long haulers with COVID, but I think now I might add, um, possibly. <laughs> I, I actually, I would encourage you, Judy, to add this. I think it's yeah. really super exciting. Yeah, I'm going to be using the uh, Ruben Gers pen battery as well. Okay. So it was interesting to see your data. Um, and then there's a question from uh, Dan Mathalon. I don't know if, if, if we can unmute him so he can ask his own question. Um, <laughs> Let him work, right? <laughs> make him work. It's a long question, but uh, I'll, I'll just start reading it. So he says, can you speak to the challenges associated with trying to augment D1 signaling in the prefrontal cortex in patients with schizophrenia with a D1 agonist targeting neurocognitive deficits? Well, Dan, I love your question. <laughs> <laughs> so we've done a lot of work with D1 and it's, it's pretty clear that, you know, you have dopamine deficit in the cortex, you may have abnormalities in D1, but the picture is that D1 is a main mediator of cognition, uh, prefrontal related cognition, and we need to do something about it to improve cognition in schizophrenia. There have not 
been good D1 drugs up until recently. So for example, one drug that is available was available dehydroxidine or DAR100A, which is kind of like a specific isomer of dehydroxidine. We've tried, the issue is it, it, does, it doesn't get into the brain enough. So that the study we did was almost at like no measurable D1 occupancy by the drug. So, you know, the results were negative but I don't know what it means since we didn't occupy the D1 receptor. We, we went ahead with the study because of the work of Stacy Kastner suggesting that infinitesimally small doses of D1 agonism may be good enough. Well, we don't see that in, in subjects we've, we've uh, kind of um, uh, published that. But the other challenge besides the drugs not being available is the target <laughs> itself and how to approach the target. So the target is, is um, uh, you know, you can't pin it down very well. Then the reason I say that is that we have evidence from imaging and also evidence from work in Pat Goldmarek Hicks lab that D1 receptor down regulates with antipsychotic treatment in the cortex. Uh, and it's a long-term effect. So you could have high D1 and you give people Haldol or whatever, D1 will go down, will become normal. So in a way you have a moving target in terms of expression. In addition, you know, the work in, uh, with rodents and monkeys showing that if you have low D1 stimulation, you're gonna have poor cognitive performance, high D1 stimulation of poor cognitive performance. You really need to have an optimal stimulation, which is this kind of like very tricky balance of how much D1, how much dopamine, how much binding, like this optimal level that's gonna be great. Well, achieving this optimal level in just every patient, that's a big mystery. How do you do it? So um, I mean, D1 agonist, just giving a little bit of a stimulation and a long kind of term scenario is not ideal, but at this point we're testing it. We have a U01 with Yale, uh, Columbia, and U UPenn. Um, the, the girls to test AD1 agonists in schizophrenia in collaboration with Sarah Val, who've inherited, I mean, David Gray is the chemist, took the drug with him. Another approach would be a positive allosteric modulator, which basically would enhance the dopamine signal as it is present in the cortex. The problem with that is that if there is really a deficit in dopamine in the cortex, there isn't much to potentiate with a PAM. So that's another uh, potential challenge. So it's a very tricky uh, area of work. We're, we're undertaking it and we'll see what the results are. We're testing though four doses because again, another challenge is that, I mean, you don't know what occupancy uh, is best. How much occupancy of the D1 do you need to improve cognition? It's not really clear. So this, at least the study will inform us uh, about some of those basic facts, even if we don't get the results we want. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Dan has another question as well. I, I think, think he's unmuted. I'm afraid we might be out of time though. Is that, how are we doing on time? We're three it's minutes over. Three. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that, I don't know if that matters. Just, do we all disappear um, in, into the Zoom ether? You should check with the, um, <laughs> the leaders of the, the, cause last time I did this, it was pretty sharp, to, but I mean, I could ask another question, but I don't have to. Uh, you have Go time ahead. to ask another question. <clears throat> so, uh, Anissa, thank you for that on the, on the, um, the D1. I just going back to the, um, uh, dopamine release work and the amphetamine challenge work. I was wondering what you, how important you thought the role of the COMT Valmet polymorphism was in doing those kinds of assays and whether um, it wasn't clear whether you take that genotype into account, the, you know, specifically with the relationships with working memory, I would predict that individuals who have the MET, -MET polymorphism with a dopamine, um, uh, uh, an amphetamine challenge the more they release dopamine, it may be that the worse their working memory gets, not the better because of where they fall on that inverted curve. And I wonder if that's just fiction and good in theory, but in practice, it doesn't matter. You don't have to, you don't have to yeah. measure it. 
So no, this is a very, very important question. I mean, um, the, those, the, the level of activity of these enzymes will be very important in the cortex, not so much in the striatum, obviously, because striatum, you have the DAT and it, dopamine is picked up immediately. But in the cortex, the level of uh, act activity of these enzymes will determine how much dopamine is floating around. And we examined this when we looked at D1. And we actually have a paper published showing that the, the ones that have low dopamine, uh, is, that's the valval, right? Uh, yeah, they're the more efficient enzyme, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Had high levels of D1, exactly mm -hmm. like what we see also in ketamine users and in patients with schizophrenia. Uh, when we did the, the dopamine release study, the FLB study, we actually did not measure this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you, you're you very uh, right that maybe we should have, and that is, is an, I mean, it's obviously an important variable, and it's actually maybe an important variable now when we're doing the D1 agonist study. I will bring it up to the consortium and tell them, hey, Dan Matalon has a <laughs> suggestion for us that <laughs> we overlooked. <laughs> it may be a very important thing to, to yeah, I, I agree with you. It's, uh, Thank it's you, Anissa. It was a wonderful Thank talk. You. Yes, Thank it, you. It, indeed, indeed it was. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I, I have a question. I know that we're way over, but this is, this is, um, sort of important to me as I get older and older. Your, your findings with the pen performance, cognitive uh, battery and um, acetylcholine, yeah. what does this say about Aricept and using Aricept to help? Because um, it's a cholinergic drug. Yeah, it increases mean, acetylcholine. And so Aricept works in dementia, right? Not very well. I'm wondering, but oh, I'm wondering why yes. it doesn't make it worse, considering yeah, so, what you're I mean, finding. <laughs> so one thing I want to say is that, I mean, schizophrenia and dementia may be completely different in terms of how mm -hmm. you, you approach cognition. And um, it may be, so here we're seeing high acetylcholine is kind of bad. But, you mm -hmm. know, dementia, I think it's pretty clear that you need to, to boost acetylcholine. I wouldn't necessarily you know, make like parallel across these two because they may have very different reasons to have cognitive impairment. Okay, it's good a, point. It's a good thing to think about though. Yeah, well, I, <clears throat> I haven't started to use it. And then I, so. <laughs> also, I, I also, I'm not advocating that the finding in schizophrenia is real at this point. I'm just showing you this preliminary data that is very, mm -hmm. um, puzzling, but, you know, obviously it needs to be expanded and replicated. I'm just yep. surprised that it keeps showing up, you know, yep. like now with 24 patient subjects or so, it's still there. It's like weird. It should have gone away by now. If it, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I still like somehow I'm skeptical, but I just wanted to show you something new. Yep. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's exciting. Um, anybody else in the audience? I know we've run over, but... Uh... I'm, Anissa probably would like to get take a break, but um, you can unmute yourself and make a comment, ask a question if you want to. Otherwise, join me in thanking Anissa for a brilliant talk. Thank you very much. Um, it was wonderful. Thank you. Anissa, thank you so much. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll have you back as soon as the pandemic is over so you can come and join us in person. Mm -hmm. That would be a lot of fun. Thank you. That would be lovely. Day. Thank you, Judy. Bye. Thank you, Anissa. Bye-bye.